I kind of put two lectures together for this one because when we were given this lecture when I was in phase C, it was pretty short. The law of entropy was its own lecture and the law of octaves was its own lecture and they were both pretty short. So I put them together. I think it is still kind of short. But we can have free discussion of that after and we can do some more meditative stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so. Nice. So we're going to talk about two, two separate laws, but they're really, they're really connected. That's why I put them together in the same lecture. So it's called the law of entropy and the law of octaves. Here's Samael on board. You have to practice whether you like it or not. So we're basically going to be talking about that. I know we've been talking a lot about that kind of thing, but it's true. The practice is what you have to do. So first we'll talk about the law of entropy. I don't know if anybody has an idea of what it is already. Is no. it too dark? Oh, well, no, it's fine for me. How's it else it's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Okay. okay. Yeah, so the law of entropy, it, it's a scientific law too. But we're going to talk about it. So the law of entropy states that all closed systems will eventually break down into disorganized chaos. That's a little bit more of like a closer to the scientific definition, not really the way we look at it. But basically, everything returns to its starting point. This is the law of entropy. Everything reduces to its lowest common denominator. Scientifically, this is the more scientific. Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics related to the unavailability of heat energy for work. So we're not really going to talk about it in that sense. But we're going to talk about it. In Gnosis, we apply the law of entropy to the inner work. So basically, the idea of entropy is that at the beginning, they, they say it applies to the universe. In Gnosis, we don't really apply entropy to the universe. But there are some systems, say that the Big Bang spread out. And over time, everything's going to slow down and then dissolve into disorganization. That's basically what entropy is. We'll give you some examples here. So, like, when a new activity starts, it is supported by enthusiasm and interest. This is more to do with the, with the work, mm -hmm. the inner work. We're not going to talk about it scientifically over here. It is easy and enjoyable. For example, I, I pick cleaning the house because sometimes, you know, you get this burst of energy and you decide you're going to clean the entire house and... <laughs> top to bottom and just get her looking beautiful. So you clean it up quick and easy, you got the tunes on, it's not hard, you're excited about it, it's no problem. Then you get a great sense of accomplishment when you see the house, oh, it's a beautiful condition, it's so beautiful now, I did all this work, it paid off. Once the house is clean, you can relax and enjoy the fruits of your labor. So we've all kind of been through this kind of thing. But after the initial energy is exerted to clean the house, the law of entropy sets in immediately after it's clean entropy sets in. If you do not apply continual effort to keep the house clean, it will return back to a state of disorder and mess. We've all seen that. That's why you got to do spring cleaning. We wouldn't have to do spring cleaning if we kept it clean all year round. And that's basically the idea of entropy right there. The idea is if when, once you stop ap applying the energy or the initial enthusiasm and force, it will result, dissolve back into its lowest common denominator to the very beginning where it started or worse kind of thing. So, entropy is a natural force in our universe, in the physical universe. You can see it with the equalization of pressures and temperatures. You know, if you put ice cubes in a glass of water, the, the ice cubes melt and the, and the water cools down, but they, they reach homeostasis. They kind of, mm -hmm. so the ice cubes don't stay. Uh, the decomp decomposition of organic material is the same thing. It'll break back down to its base components. And, you know, inertia and the cessation of motion, if you roll a bowling ball, it will eventually stop going. You know, it's because like, of friction and stuff like that. But this is to get the idea of entropy kind of going. You kind of have an idea of what entropy is, right? Is it getting, is it clear? Yes. Okay, okay. Without a constant application of energy, all things return to their starting point. So this is what we're going to more apply to all things. Unfortunately, entropy also affects the work on the path, and it affects it in a big way. We are all subjected to the universal law of entropy, every one of us right now sitting here. If we do not apply constant energy to the work, we will be reduced to our lowest common denominator. This is a universal law of nature. Uh, it's blurry. You sit like that. It looks blurry. Yeah. Thanks for noticing. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, we can take a minute. Probably got some extra time. What all this go for? So this is just a quote from Balkan Havel, a Czech playwright, poet, and politician. 
who's the president. Just as the constant increase of entropy is the basic law of the universe, so it is the basic law of life to be ever more highly structured and to struggle against entropy. So the idea of entropy increasing means that, you know, st structure is decreasing. So it's kind of a weird concept. But he's, he's talking about this on the social level, which is really more applied to, to the social level, to the spiritual work. When we begin the work, when we first begin the path of Gnosis, we are excited and enthusiastic. And we've all been there, phase A, and just pumped, happy. We're still happy to be here, because you guys are really hanging on, so you guys are still enthusiastic. <laughs> um, the work, and by the work I'm talking about meditation, materialization, self-observation, you know, working with the energies and the transmutations and all that. It's all new and invigorating. It's all new, it's all exciting. We are receiving a great amount of help from the masters of the White Lodge. This is something we don't always recognize, but generally, when we first start the path, we receive a lot of help. I found this to be true when I first joined Gnosis too. I felt like I was doing the work, I was getting a lot of results, I was being sort of helped along. And then there'll come a point where you plateau and we'll get more into the plateau in that, but where entropy sets in. And the masters of the White Lodge say, okay, we've helped them with baby steps, but now, so you can sort of experience what it's like, now you have to work at doing it yourself. So it feels like maybe the experiences don't come as often anymore, or it's harder, because the work is hard. It only seemed easy when it was easy, because you were being helped. But eventually, it's going to fall all on your own shoulders. So, uh, yeah. I was reading The Alchemist, and that's exactly what he said in there. He said, like, beginner's luck. You're always successful. Like sure. a beginner, you know, yep. first ball you throw, you, you you know hit everything. And yep. because of that, because your um, um, higher powers want you to be successful. Exactly. They want to give you a taste of the work, mm -hmm. basically, so you can be like, wow, this, there is something to this. I felt something here, and, there's, and I'm, you know, I'm really good at it. You think at first until you realize now you have to put the work in yourself. So we receive experiences and help from above to keep us going in the work, basically. Like there's, this is a generalization, but this is what Samael stated, but generally when we first start this path, we receive a lot of help from our Divine Mother, from the higher beings, from the Masters of the White Lodge. And as we go along, however over time, our enthusiasm starts to fade. And you can see this in all different facets of life but we're, we're applying it specifically to the Gnostic path. We become stale and lazy. The work becomes routine and starts to become less and less important in our daily lives. This is, this is entropy setting in right here. We begin to let ourselves become swallowed up by the mechanicity of life. Our experiences stop and our progress deteriorates back to its starting point. This is, this is a fundamental fact. And, if you examine yourself, maybe, I'm not suggesting in the work, but in any other aspect of life, I'm sure you can see this coming. To maybe any endeavor you start, you think I'm going to learn to knit or something. And you start knitting, you knit a bunch of stuff, and then you stop practicing, and then you didn't buy yarn, and now you're, mm -hmm. oh, I don't have time to knit. So uh, this is entropy pulling you back down to where you started. Before you couldn't knit, you started learning, got enthusiastic. Entropy set in. We didn't know about entropy. We just went along with the flow of nature because we're, we're natural mechanical beings got pulled right back down to not being able to knit again. This is the law of entropy. So this is called the psychological night. You might have heard this term before. No, no you haven't? Okay, well, Samuel talks about it a lot, but a psychological night is when you, you know, well, we'll talk about it. This is known as a psychological night, basically, what we just said in the last slide, when you get pulled back down to your lowest point, or you feel like you're going backwards, or you feel like you're not going forward, you plateaued, you're, you're not as enthusiastic, you're not really putting in the practice, you're not doing the work, and you feel like it's less important than it was before. This is a psychological night. During a psychological night, we don't feel like practicing. We are discouraged and feel like nothing is working. We become lazy and tired of the path. It is during the psychological night that students of the path give up and leave the work. This is kind of a pretty obvious statement because when people are during a psychological day which is the flip side when everything's working and you're having experiences and you're loving the path um, you're not going to leave the work but it's only during these psychological nights that we all leave and we have to understand that everyone goes through these when we experience them we're not really thinking of them as like a cycle like oh I'm going through a night another day is going to come we just we don't think ahead like that we think oh it's not working forget about it I'm going to go watch the Super Bowl or something like that and then just forget about it go back to worrying about work and family and all the mechanical stuff again. And then if we're lucky, a spark will say, hey, what about the work? And we'll get back to work and maybe 
ha have a psychological day, but not necessarily, not necessarily, because entropy is, is a law of nature, but there's no law of nature that says you have to get free yourself from the wheel of samsara. That's why it's revolutionary psychology, because it's not evolutionary. It's all up to us to do that part. Psychological nights do not end by themselves, which I basically just stated there. Entropy is the law of nature, but it's not a cycle that says you're going to, you know, have a psychological night and then get illuminated later on down the week. You can have a psychological night and stay there. It takes a great amount of effort, willpower, activity, and sacrifice to overcome psychological night. Progress does not happen in a wonderful straight line where everything constantly improves. Probably by phase C, we've probably seen that already. We've probably noticed that because you guys have been coming here for, I don't know, by phase C, it might be a year or under a year, I'm not sure. Almost a year. Almost a year. year. April. Yeah, a year in April. Mm -hmm. So in, over that year, you can look back and you can probably see a lot of experiences. You had some really great times. Maybe you had some frustrating times. You know that the progress isn't like, hey, I come here once a week to Wolfgang's house and boom, straight to the stars. I'm getting illuminated <laughs> bit by bit every week. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <Does it? laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that would be nice. That's the ego's way out. Let's yeah. just do it yeah, easy yeah, as yeah. possible. That's right. Um, but it is a better fight against the natural law of entropy and the egos. Mm -hmm. They're kind of linked. You should know that everything is not rosy on the path. There will be times when you don't feel like doing the work. Esoteric teachings will seem to no longer matter. This is just a process of nature. This is the way it goes on the path. Huge sacrifices must be made in order to overcome a psychological night. That's why, that's why it's hard to overcome them, and that's why it seems like it's against the law of nature, because we have to make sacrifices to overcome them. We have to do a lot of extra work to overcome these psychological nights. So here we're going to talk a little bit about entropy and sacrifice. This is another one of William Blake's artworks, and I always put his artwork in wherever I can because I like it. But uh, it's a sacrifice of Job. I don't know if it has too much to do other than it's a sacrifice. And we're talking about sacrifice. So it is important to understand that sacrifices have to be made in order to progress spiritually. When something inferior is sacrificed, something superior can manifest. And that's why we have to make sacrifices. It's not because of some evil god who's like, I want you to be in pain, and then maybe I'll throw you a bone kind of thing. It's because we're sacrificing lower nature so that higher nature can manifest. <clears throat> Materials are sacrificed so that a house can be built, as a, as a small example. Or an animal's life is sacrificed so that another may, may live. These are examples of, of this idea of sacrifice. Old habits and ways of living are sacrificed so that new spiritual ones may take their place. That's the sacrifice we're talking about. Um, egos are sacrificed so that consciousness can be rescued. We must sacrifice our lower qualities so that we may advance in the work. It kind of makes sense, because now we're talking about eliminating our ego so we can go further on the spiritual path, because as we talked about, you can't go far with your egos, but that's not really the path that we're trying to take here. We're trying to take the, the path of the razor's edge. <coughs> so gambling, drinking in the pubs, attachment to television. These are just as, as examples I said. These aren't like mandatory rules that I'm putting down, but these are the kind of uh, lower qualities that I'm, that I'm just using as examples. But if you, you know, we can't expect to continue these ventures if we wish to advance past a certain point in the path doesn't mean that every vice you have right now you have to give up. You have to give them up in an order, in like a systematic sort of order, because if you wanted to become, I don't know, if you wanted to become more healthy, you know, have a better body so you can hopefully incarnate your being one day, then obviously you're going to have to give up McDonald's sooner or later, maybe not right now, maybe later, right? But that, that's kind of the idea. If you want to help people, then you have to, you know, get over your arrogance at some point. Like this is the idea. Well, these are going to be huge roadblocks on the path. <coughs> yeah, we're blowing through this bad boy. Okay, so fighting entropy is very important. We're going to have some tips on how to fight it. Can I turn this off? I'm fine. Yeah, you can turn it off. Yeah, if everyone's wanting, yeah, I do. Anybody know who this is over here? No. Jared. 
St. George, yeah, St. George and the Dragon, yeah. St. George, yeah. It's one of the oldest uh, tales of uh, St. George. St. George and the Dragon. One of the, one of the oldest tales of uh, dragon slaying. Yeah, it represents like a battle with the eagle, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's wow. what all the dragons were, right? Yeah, yeah. So you had the dragon, you had the damsel in the stress, right? Oh, yes, yes, Satan. And the damsel is the soul. The soul. You have to save the soul by eliminating the ego. Looks like you got him with the what do you call it? The lance. Lance, yeah. Got him with the lance. More symbolism. Oh yeah, because you can see <laughs> it's sticking into his side. Yeah, mm -hmm. into the side right there. Yeah. yeah. So that, I like that picture. Who's that? William Blake again? No, I'm not sure who did this one. <laughs> I'm not sure who did this one. Uh, but it's good. Yeah. So entropy must be understood and fought against. So now we have a basic idea, and once I explain it to you, obviously the idea of what entropy is is pretty easy to catch on. Mm -hmm. The first time I came across this lecture was about an hour and a half of just kind of saying that same sort of thing. But uh, I, think, I think that we get the idea of what entropy is. So sacrifices must be made. We already said that. The path of Gnosis goes against the forces of nature. That's when we, we should have an understanding of that because... Like we say, it's the revolutionary path. We're trying to free ourselves from the wheel of samsara. What is the wheel of samsara? That's nature. Nature is the wheel of samsara. So, I mean, obviously we respect nature, we love nature, we're trying to, you know, be thankful for what we have in our physical bodies and in this world because this is giving us an opportunity to realize. But we wouldn't want to fall into the trap of, like, worshipping nature like it was the be-all and end-all. It's like some of the nature worship. That would be kind of like playing on to the bars of your prison almost, because we're trying to transcend <laughs> nature is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to transcend it. Basically what we're here to do is, is transform energies. So nature wants to keep us to transform these energies. And there's nothing saying we have to become conscious, but we can, but that's up to us. That's, that's, that's the revolutionary path that we can do, but nature's not gonna do it for us, because then you know, someone will awaken, transcend, and then there's a little bit less energy for the world as a living being, because the world is this living entity that we're all part of. But change is vital. It's very important that we start to change. We must continuously improve both within and within the activities we do. <clears throat> it's kind of important to do that. I mean, it's not important. To, like, I don't want to give the wrong impression. It's not important for me that you change yourselves. It'll be important for yourself on the path to change yourself. If you don't change, it's not like I'm not going to be your friend. But I mean, like, you have to start changing, improving. The reason why you got to improve hobbies and internally is because they're going to go hand in hand. You're going to start working on your egos and simultaneously still hanging out with your buddies who like to go, I don't know, drinking and going to strip clubs and stuff. It's going to be really going to go on the path because yeah. you're going to make some progress, get sucked back down, make some progress. It's like sitting on the fence and having uh, one foot on each side. Exactly. You've you got to make up your mind. Which exactly. You go, yeah. And that's what they're yeah. saying, because you can only go so far on the path before you have to start making these sacrifices. Yeah. You don't have to make the sacrifice of saving the friends and the drinking and the strip clubs, as long as you're understanding, okay, but you're stuck here on the path then. Yeah. And probably entry people set in when you're stuck and start pulling you back. Yeah. And that's the idea. That's why we have to keep moving forward. So if we're not moving forward and we're not aware of it, then chances are we're being pulled backwards. By entropy, this natural law. If we, yeah, if we remain static, the law of entropy will take hold and cause decline. Basically, what I just, what I just said there. So, by not changing and by not practicing and by putting it off till tomorrow, <coughs> we're gonna become we're gonna come under the influence of entropy. And Samuel and Bohr always talked about that. Those who put it off to tomorrow are gonna be doomed because there's always a tomorrow and a tomorrow and a tomorrow. So if you get into the habit of thinking, well, if I just get through this week and then next week I can start, you know, it'll make more sense. It'll be work will be cooled down a bit, or it'll be done exams or whatever. And you know, we're not saying that life doesn't get in the way because obviously it does. We're, you got to be realistic about it. But the idea of getting in the mindset of putting stuff onto tomorrow is a, a circular trap that you can fall into because then there's tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. It's like that bar, Across free free drinks tomorrow. The permanent sign, you know, free drinks tomorrow. They come out. Still says free drinks tomorrow. Just like that. So, through entropy, the egos have won many battles. <coughs> and that, that's fairly obvious because, as we say, we get static, we skip a day of practice, 
and then a week of practice, and then before you know it, it's been two months since you meditated, and now you find all of a sudden you're cloudier going through your day. You can't really observe yourself as well. You're having outbursts of anger that you thought, oh, I thought I had those egos under control. I was observing them. But then they start coming out again. It's because you're, you're physically moving backwards on the path. You must fight uh, back to recover lost ground. So, I mean, it's, the path is hard already. And then you get under the, the grasp of entropy. And now you've got to fight harder to get back to where you already were. But it's necessary and it can be done. Even though it seems like a hard and difficult battle, we must cultivate willpower. Willpower is the main weapon for fighting entropy. We have to cultivate willpower. It will allow us to persist and get back on track. If you are working weekly, you must apply more effort in order to become stronger, And if you do, not, even if you don't feel like it. Well, especially because you won't feel like it. It's like, oh, I don't really feel like practicing. You have to force yourself to practice. I've had to do this many times, you know, throughout my path, been like, oh, something's come up, or I don't know, I'm doing something else now, and like, well, no, you have to practice, so even to the point where you'd be like, just go get up, it's 11 at night, and you're tired, you're, you know, working double shift or whatever, just go and do the practice, and it happens to all of us, I'm not saying I'm a saint on the cross or anything, I'm just saying that we all get into a place where we have to physically say, okay, I have to choose right now to practice, even though it's the last thing I want to do. I'm tired, I'm in a bad mood, I had a rough day, but that'll, you know, that'll lead I'll to entropy. I'll fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. Do it. yeah. exactly. Yeah. There's times when I, my meditation, like, before it was so bad, and I, I was getting so distracted and not meditating regularly that I would, I would kneel on the ground and meditate that way, so I, there wasn't a possibility of even falling asleep. I didn't get very far, you know, in the meditation, but at least I was staying awake and then cultivating some more uh, concentration and then finally go back to the chair and meditate all right and back to the bed and meditate without falling asleep and that kind of thing. But I mean, if you go backwards, this is the kind of thing we're going to be up against. You have to start taking drastic measures. Um, there are many ways that one can begin to fight entropy. So here's a couple ways we're going to do it. The biggest one would be to change your meditative routine. You know, try a new mantra, try a new room, try a different exercise. The biggest one that I find that helps is doing different mantras for different days of the week or different mantras weekly or monthly. So you're not just doing the same mantra. For a long time I did a hip toe. That was my favorite one. I had some good experiences with it, so I just stuck with a hip toe, a hip toe every day, every day. And the experiences were getting good, and then they got less and less and less. I thought, ah, oh, it's not working, so I'm not going to do this mantra anymore. Then I found I wasn't meditating as much again, and then entropy set in. And then I got this lecture, I'm like, okay, all right, I'm going to switch it up, I'm going to do something different. Start doing the retrospection meditations, that kind of thing, and changing it up, you know. It's, it's good to have a routine, but it's, it's also good to change it. Because if you have a routine, you kind of have something to stick to. So I say, okay, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m., I'm going to do the mastery exercises, which you guys haven't seen yet, or I'm going to do the runes, and then I'm going to do some pranayamas, and then a meditation with a different mantra every morning, or maybe change it up once a week. This is a suggestion. And just stick to a time frame. And every night at 10 o'clock till 11 o'clock, I'm going to meditate. Whether it's a retrospection of the day, maybe for one week, and then the next week, maybe it'll be a mantralization, and then we can change the mantras all the time. Work with Hamsa, do some transmutation. That's why there's so many practices. There's so many practices because it's hard to stay on track, and it's hard to find one practice that works for everybody, or one practice that everybody likes. Everybody's going to resonate differently with different practices. Some people are going to like the runes more. Some people will like uh, transmutation practices. You know, there's all kinds of different practices. The idea is you can find a handful that you like and maybe start rotating them around, kind of. <coughs> or just because it is important. This is a good one, too, because it's, it's a little easier than that. If you're finding, like, you're, you've been off the path for a little while now or you're having trouble getting back in, Read a book by a true master. Read one of Samael Angor's books. You know, that's always a good pick me up. Reading one of his books because it feels like, okay, I'm on the path. I'm doing the work, getting some knowledge. It's maybe not, you know, it's not as intense as trying to figure out what's wrong with my own internal psychology, but it's it's kind of tuning my hobbies or my spare time towards the path. So that's a really good one. I've done that a lot of times, and even when I do like regular meditation, I still try and read a lot. But that's just kind of like my thing. 
sometimes it's not that good to read too much because then all your head's full of theories and not as much, not the practice. But I tend to get sucked into the enjoying reading books. But another big thing is to write down remembering past experiences to get you through the hard times. So you should be keeping a journal. You should be keeping a dream diary. It, it, it's, it's, it's highly recommended. I mean, we don't tell anybody how to live their lives. What we're saying is you should be keeping a dream diary for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you wake up in a dream or you have a, a lucid dream that you wake up in, you can write it down as soon as you wake up and then you can start to analyze it and that. But when you go through a psychological night, you can go back and you can read that. And as soon as you read those, if, if you do have dream diaries, you know what I'm talking about. As soon as you read those, it becomes just as real as when you went through it. And you're like, yep, that, it wasn't a dream. It was a, it was a definite astral experience, and this is so real to me. And I wrote it down in detail and the date and everything. And then when you're having hard times, you're not having experiences and that kind of thing, this, this will really be a big pick-me-up for you. <coughs> also, it's important to keep a, a dream diary because by writing down your dreams, even if they're not lucid or even if they're not even don't wake up in your dreams if you just remember your dreams and write them down then you're going to start having trigger points you say okay uh abraham lincoln was there and then now next time your next dream you write down abraham lincoln was there and sooner or later when you're talking to abraham lincoln you're going to say wait a minute i'm in a dream right now and then you can wake up from the dream or have a lucid dream it's going to serve as a trigger for you to understand your own dreams and triggers that let you know when you're dreaming if you don't do like the, the finger pulling or uh, the jumping techniques. It's just another technique that you can use. And those techniques are really good ones. Um, it, is, it is really important to work at gaining astral experiences. Like we talked about earlier, you know, just casually, we're talking about astral projection isn't like the be all end all of what the Gnosis school is, right? Sometimes these people, we're talking about who, who have these esoteric personalities, I just want to get clairvoyance or astral projection and that kind of thing. That's not the main goal, because the main goal is liberation. But this, the experience of an astral projection is going to be very important in helping you to keep going because you're going to experience this new state of reality and it'll be so real to you. They're like, they're, what they're talking about is real. I've experienced this, I've had this experience, and this means more to me than just my mundane life of work and sleep and food. There's something going on here, and this will keep you on the path. Remembering that those astral experiences you've had, even if they're small or few and far in and between, or even if they're just really symbolic dreams, because symbolic dreams are on the same path as, you know, symbolic dreams, lucid dreams, waking up in a dream, and then, you know, the idea of actually consciously feeling the unfoldment process, and that kind of thing. These are all really important because they're going to cultivate willpower and then strength to keep going in the work. That's why it's good to sometimes, you know, hear people talking about different experiences we don't talk overly too much about our own personal experiences because the idea is most experiences you have are tailored for you. It's your own psychology, your own divine being. So if you're told some information that's really important, chances are it's really important to you. So it's not like I'm at a certain spot in my life and I get told something and I say, oh, my friends, this is what I've been told. This is what is going to work for all of us. It's not going to work that way because everybody's individual. We all have our own egos. We all have our own problems that we have to work out. But uh, so it's important to, to 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 work towards astral experiences, and we have we have the practices. We know the Ahipto, Faraon, Lara S, all these mantras. Um, I'm sure you guys talked about the idea of setting your alarm clock for different times throughout the night, and then you can turn it off and try and do some mantraization. That that's a good one. That's a good one. Maybe on a. I don't have to get up early. Then. Yeah, that's why I recommend doing that one on a, on a weekend. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you'll most likely have more success doing that than any other way. Oh, really? Other than waking up in a dream. Yeah, because when you go to bed at night and we try to astral project, for most of us, we're so psychologically and emotionally drained from the day, from expending so much energy, that you need a little bit of time, that sleep, that you're going to just go off into sleep and not be conscious of it. You're going to rejuvenate the energy. Then at 4 a.m. your alarm clock goes off, you just get up real quick, shut it off, lie down, try and focus on a, a mantra that you like, or try, sometimes you won't even have to. I find mostly, mostly this is the effective way that I've done it, just because of where I am, that I can't, I can't lie down and consciously actually project, you know, I'm not there, not like that, but I find that if you sleep first and then wake up and go back to sleep, it's easier to come out of your body because you're already more refreshed, more rested 
you don't have all the thoughts of the day going through your head as you're you know, falling asleep. So that, that's a really good one. And those experiences, <clears throat> those, these experiences cultivate faith and motivation in the work. So I mean, like at first when you're doing astral projection and that kind of thing, maybe it's not going to be, maybe it'll be two seconds, like, oh, you feel yourself come out of your body, you're floating around, and back into your body. But at the same time, even that small amount of experience, it's going to say, wow, something is going on here that's bigger than what I had ever thought before. I mean, that was the impression I first got when I came here. Like, these really minor experiences that happen over long periods of time, you know, they're few and far between, but enough to be like, something going on here. So the memory of these experiences will help to develop devotion, and most importantly of all, willpower, like we said. Trying to develop willpower, that's the most important. Because you're going to need that willpower. Here's the, this next way of fighting it. <laughs> Might feel like a bit of a pitch. But teaching these courses is a way to fight entropy also. I remember when we went through this one too. So teaching helps fight entropy. It does. Because you know you feel like you have a responsibility towards the students. So it keeps you oriented on the path. Um, it helps you through the low states. Your preparing material helps you connect with the teachings more. Now, I, I found that to be true, even stuff that I thought I wasn't that interested in. If you have to do a lecture on it, you just you get interested in it because you're researching it, you're reading the books, you're reading what Samael said, you're reading the, the past lectures that other Gnostic instructors have, have written. And uh, teaching is also an excellent way to practice sacrifice, also, I say, because you know, you got to put more work in and you got to, I don't know. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice to me because you know, we all like being here. But it gears your free time towards esoteric studies instead of mundane hobbies. So instead of, say, me sitting at home watching a hockey game, I'll be you know, getting this short lecture ready for everybody kind of thing. You know? And if you're a teacher, you'll be doing that stuff. And you'll be stressing out at first. Like, cause this is like, a, like everyone knows this is my brother and I's first time teaching a phase C class. So it's stressful because you always feel like you're always under the gun, always trying to get the next lecture ready. That's why we're alternating right now, because he's at home working on his lecture for you guys next week. And uh, when you're first new to this stuff, you have to figure out all this PowerPoint, which I know some of the techies now big yeah, has nothing to it. But some of the guys like, oh man, how, you, how come this word comes up and that one won't come up? And you get, computers are crashing and stuff. So. <laughs> but uh, I guess that's part of the sacrifice. I don't know. If the Gnostic path is seen as a mere hobby, playing second fiddle to other interests, the results will be failure. That's what Samael states. This path that we're doing here isn't a hobby. It's not something, oh, I got some free time, so maybe I'll go try and uh, you know, awaken my consciousness. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really work like that. It's a lifelong path. We've got to start slowly. Once we start gearing our free time towards this kind of thing, that's the idea also of making those sacrifices, like we said. Not going to the bar, not, you know, whatever, not running around with my buddies being, being an idiot and got to read the books, got to put the lectures together, this kind of thing. So it, it does help, and it's fun to be part of the part of the gang, part of the part of the crew. <laughs> so um, we must fight against entropy with all of our might. This is a picture of Jacob's ladder, but it's one of the ones I like because you see the demons pulling people off the ladder, and in my mind that's entropy pulling you back down. You know, you got to keep walk, you got to keep going upwards. You got to fight the egos and entropy that are trying to pull you down. Only by the conscious application of additional effort and willpower can we overcome the force of entropy. Willpower and more effort, that's the only way to overcome it. Only by overcoming entropy can we move forward on the path to a new and higher octave in the work. 